All right, let, let's kick off. Um, I'm really excited. We've got a fantastic panel here today. Uh, we're going to be doing a whistle-stop tour of really all the major issues in financial services litigation. Um, we have uh, George Hall from Reed Smith. Uh, he'll be talking to us about LIBOR transition and interest rate claims. Jasper Dillon, QC from Brick Court, who'll be talking about derivative claims and the is the master agreement. Rosalyn Phelps, QC from Fountain Court, who'll be talking about quince care and push payment fraud. Uh, and Ian uh, Bean of Greenberg Traurig will talk about ESG and financial services. So an awful lot to cover. Um, and so we should, we, could, we should kick off. I'm actually gonna start uh, by talking uh, about claims arising out of the LIBOR scandal in 2012. Now, we'll all be aware uh, of this scandal. It was, it was when certain banks were found to have been rigging uh, LIBOR to suit their own commercial purposes, and they were fined by regulators for doing so. And in particular today, I'm going to talk about claims for implied representations and the level of awareness that a claimant must have when a representation is being made. So we're gonna be going down a little bit of a rabbit hole. I just bear, bear with me. Um, this might seem like a very narrow point, and in fact it is, but it is essential for anyone who wants to claim uh, for misrepresentation. And it's a particularly tricky element when you have a case where the representation can be implied through conduct. Now, of course, uh, we need to prove awareness in any claim for misrepresentation. It isn't just claims in LIBOR. Um, indeed, it could be other uh, benchmark manipulations such as is, is the fix or FX, or indeed any uh, misrepresentation. So we know it's possible to make an implied representation through conduct as to the integrity of LIBOR. The Court of Appeal in PAG determined that it was possible to make an actionable representation simply by proffering the transaction documents based upon LIBOR. And this representation can be framed in a number of different ways and, and indeed has been, but at, at its most basic, it would be that the bank does not is not manipulating LIBOR, has no reason to believe LIBOR would be manipulated or that it might be manipulated in the future. But what the Court of Appeal giveth, the, the, the first instance judges of the High Court taketh away, or uh, perhaps the inverse, depending on your point of view. There have been a number of cases concerning uh, LIBOR that have addressed this particular issue of awareness. Uh, and these culminated last year in the case of Leeds versus Barclays, uh, in which I represented seven local authorities who had taken out long-term uh, so-called lender option, borrower option loans, LOBOs. Uh, and this was a claim for implied uh, representation uh, to do with LIBOR. The, the genesis of this requirement for awareness actually can be found in all uh, classic cases regarding misrepresentation. But more recently, and in the context of LIBOR, we had uh, the judgment of Mr. Justice Pickin in the case of Marme and Versiones, and he coined the phrase conscious contemporaneous thought. The case was actually decided on other grounds, but in Obita, Pickin stated that a claimant must prove that they gave contemporaneous conscious thought to the representation. Now, there's another line of cases, uh, often in the House of Lords, where this level of awareness, the awareness that's required to prove representation, uh, is much more akin to an assumption of honesty. And these cases include the case of the Spice Girls, uh, who impliedly represented to the scooter company, for whom they were filming an advert, that Jerry Halliwell uh, did not intend to leave the band. Another such case is that of DPP versus Ray. Uh, in this case, uh, Mr. Ray walked into a, a Chinese restaurant and he ordered a, a prawn chop suey and rice. And in placing this order, he impliedly represented to the waiter that he was intending to pay the 47 pence, which the meal cost. However, this representation turned out to be false when he left the restaurant without paying and he was subsequently prosecuted for deceit. Now, I'm not gonna to cover today lots of really interesting aspects of this debate because we just don't have time, but those would include uh, a debate around the erosion of the line between claims for misrepresentation and claims for non-disclosure, whether this awareness element that we're talking about is separate from and precedes the questions of causation and inducement, and what role the presumption of inducement plays in fraud claims. 
Instead, I really want to focus in on this question um, of awareness. And the question at its heart is, is a debate, really, it's somewhat sort of epistemological. It's what, what does awareness mean? And, and it's a genuine conundrum. And I think the two sides of this debate could be framed in very broad terms in this way. On the one hand, defendants would say, how can it be said that a claimant relied upon a representation when it's not even clear the claimant understood at the time that representation was being made? This is a very fair point. How can you be induced to enter into a contract by a representation when you weren't aware of it? On the other hand, a claimant might say, how can a defendant, and here we're often talking about fraudulent misrepresentation, so how can a fraudster get away with a fraud just so long as the nature of that fraud is sufficiently obscure that the claimant cannot have had it in its mind, uh, had, had it in its, in its contemplation when the representation was being made? And this argument is often framed as the, the rogue's charter. It's effectively setting down a blueprint for fraudsters to commit fraud without consequence. Now, this isn't an easy uh, question to solve at all. Um, turning back to those two lines of cases, one uh, typified by DPP versus Ray, the other typified by Marme and Versiones and, and Leeds, um, Mrs. Justice Cockrell, in, in the Leeds case, made a really valiant attempt to try and reconcile these two lines of cases. But ultimately, I'm not quite sure that she, she managed to do it. Mrs. Justice Cockrell agreed that the waiter in DPP versus Ray decided to convey the order to the kitchen based upon an implied representation made by Mr. Ray, because the waiter was actively, albeit almost automatically, processing this question is the customer good for the money? She points out that it's not unheard of for a person in these circumstances to answer that question in the negative if the customer's behavior is suspect, suspect in some way. Uh, and in a footnote, she points to the scene in, in Pretty Women where Julia Roberts is refused service in a boutique on Rodeo Drive. However, I'm not really sure that she gets to the essence of the question here because in the case where the waiter refuses service to a rowdy crowd, or the women in Rodeo Drive refuse to serve Julia Roberts, there's no false representation, there's no fraud. In these circumstances, through their conduct, these people were giving a true representation of their intentions. The difficulty in the cases at hand is the person is attempting to commit a fraud. They're purposefully representing through their conduct that the situation is other than it is. And I think here we come back to the rogues charter. If you're intending to defraud someone through an implied representation, do you just have to ensure that you play your part well? Had Julia Roberts, in fact, intended to defraud the snobby assistants on Rodeo Drive, she'd have been better placed to do so going into the shop wearing a suit rather than wearing her blue and white getup and her black boots. I think if we take a step back and we sort of try to get out of these intellectual pretzels, what's really happening is that the representee is working on the basis of an assumption of honesty. The waiter assumes that the seemingly upstanding gentleman in front of him intends to pay the bill. The local authorities assume that the benchmark contained in the contract is an independently set benchmark. And Mrs. Justice Cockrell recognizes this, and she states in the judgment, there will, however, be cases where the element of awareness comes very close to something which might loosely be characterized as assumption, the dividing line between giving contemporaneous conscious thought to the conduct and contemporaneous conscious thought to the representation in some cases will be thin to non-existent. However, in the case of uh, Leeds versus Barclays, she decided primarily based on the precedent that had already been established uh, that the, the claimants could not meet the necessary standard of awareness and she struck out the case. She did give leave to appeal, uh, but the case is settled before it got to the Court of Appeal. Now, in subsequent development, we have Mr. Justice Waxman uh, in the case of Crossley versus Volkswagen, um, who actually considered the same line of cases and came to the opposite conclusion. Uh, in this case, these are the cases concerning a, a defeat device uh, that was uh, put into VW cars, um, and it was able to recognize when the vehicle was being tested uh, for the purpose of ensuring compliance with the emissions regulations. And it allowed it to pass that test when in fact, when the car was driven in normal conditions, uh, the emissions were above the legal limit. 
And the defendants attempted to strike out this case based upon the reasoning in Leeds to say that the claimant did not give contemporaneous conscious thought to this uh, representation. Again, uh, Mr. Justice Waxman considered the same line of cases, DPP and Ray, uh, and Leeds, Mame, and he actually came to the, uh, the other conclusion. He said uh, he didn't strike out the case. And, and he appears to say, he appears really to embrace this notion of an assumption uh, of honesty. He also talks about a counterfactual of truth. So what would the claimants do had they known the, 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 the truth? So where does this leave us? I think on, on one interpretation, it could be said that in cases of implied uh, representation, it is sufficient to work on the basis of an assumption of honesty combined with a counterfactual of truth, unless the fraud in question was perpetrated uh, by bankers manipulating libel. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a very satisfactory state of affairs. Um, I mentioned at the top that we were going to be going down a rabbit hole, and I fear that perhaps we've got somewhat lost in this rabbit hole. Uh, and maybe we now need uh, the Court of Appeal to, to wake us up. Um, but that's one view. Um, I'd be interested to know if the panel have other views or if they have uh, uh, questions. I've got a question, Lucy. Um, I, just on the, uh, the way that you've described it, it sounds as if the question of um, cross-examination of the claimant becomes particularly important given that the test is awareness. Is that something that you're seeing in the cases? I think many of the cases haven't actually got to this point. Obviously, the two cases I've been discussing, Leeds uh, and, uh, and uh, the Crossley case, and in fact, Mame, were all on strikeout applications. And so this issue of awareness was, was sort of, you know, it, it, at least in the Leeds case, the facts were taken uh, as, as, as established that the fraud had been committed. Um, uh, and we were really just arguing on the law on this particular point. But I think that is absolutely right that when these cases go to trial, uh, trying to prove this, this, this point is, 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 is going to be absolutely key and is going to turn on, uh, on, on, on the witness evidence and, you know, and potentially the documents, because I think you have to try and build up the, the factual case. Even if you haven't got an express representation in writing, you can try and build the factual case looking at the, the documentary uh, evidence as well. So is it right that um, very few cases have gone to, I mean, PAG obviously went to trial. How many others have actually gone to a full trial then? Not many. No, they haven't. I mean, we, you had the, the Deutsche Bank versus Unitec in front of um, uh, Mr. Justice Knowles, but in fact, the, uh, the, you know, the, the party, they didn't show up to court. And so uh, that wasn't even a full trial either, although he did decide uh, the, this particular question along the same grounds. Um, but no, I mean, you've had Grazley. The, the, we ha I'm not sure. I might be wrong. and Maybe others in the audience can, uh, can, uh, can correct me. But I'm not sure that we've had a trial where the issue in question is this particular issue. And of course, in relation to LIBOR, we're coming up against limitation, aren't we? I think we have. I think we've probably passed limitation, frankly, uh, for, for, for the most part. There are still some cases making their way through the courts. But as I mentioned, this would be equally applicable to uh, is the fix, for example, probably a slightly di more difficult case to prove. Uh, but but indeed, you know, any, any other scandal that might happen going forward, because can often we can often rely on our bankers to, to call some havoc somewhere. <laughs> Lucy. Uh, like me, I know that you've uh, had very extensive experience on the other side of the pond, and I was wondering whether you may have detected any difference in approach to similar types of issues uh, on that side of the pond that may or may not have any um, divergence or influence on uh, what you're seeing in the case law uh, in this jurisdiction. I mean, I'm not as close to the case law in the US. It's been really, really interesting that actually different jurisdictions have come up with different views of the libel scandal itself. In fact, I think it's recently been held that, uh, that actually what was happening with libel wasn't even fraudulent and that it was just business as usual. Um, and, and, and I think it's possible that that sort of thinking might, might have some influence. Uh, I think probably the, the case law is somewhat established here now. Um, and and uh, and uh, you know it, it, it wouldn't influence to too to great an extent. I mean, just to follow up on that, uh, obviously one of the biggest differences between uh, commercial trials in this jurisdiction and uh, uh, the United States, in particular New York, 
uh, being the, uh, the the commercial counterpart to London, is that trials will be before, uh, presumptively before a jury in the US. And uh, from a layperson's perspective, some of the um, distinctions that you, you're drawing in the case law might be seen as rather fine. And I wonder whether uh, a layperson's response um, to, to, to the fraud and the question of representation and uh, inducement reliance might be different. I don't know whether you... you I, I am actually, that's absolutely right. I mean, trying to explain these concepts to my clients uh, and then even more trying to explain them to journalists was a sort of exercise in futility and they would end up just sort of staring back at you going, what are you on about? These people are fraudsters and, and yet there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, and, I do, and I do think that that's correct, you know, whether, whether or not it's for, for, for the good, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I wonder if now is a good time to, to move on. And I think the sort of next uh, logical thing to discuss is, is LIBOR transition, because obviously the reason, one of the reasons we're transitioning out of LIBOR is coming out of, out of the LIBOR uh, scandal. So, um, George, perhaps you can uh, talk to us a bit about that. Thanks, Lucy. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so as Lucy uh, indicated, I wanted to talk about um, two topics, the first of which is um, cases arising out of the LIBOR transition, and the second is potential cases involving banks arising from um, rising interest rates. So um, in starting off then with LIBOR transition, um, I think it's fair to say that the sort of the dire warnings from early 2019 uh, haven't yet transpired, and I think that's for three for three main reasons. Um, the first is that the time period for compliance has been extended and staggered, and there's also been the creation of synthetic LIBOR, so there hasn't been this sharp cliff edge between, on the one hand, pre-LIBOR and then post-LIBOR, and I'll talk about that in, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, the second main reason um, is the further regulation and legislation that's been introduced particularly for the so-called tough legacy contracts. And again, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then I think the third reason is it's obviously a generalisation and there are exceptions, but, but parties on the whole have engaged with the issue and have sought to renegotiate uh, their contracts. So dealing with the, um, the cliff edge point to start off with and, and sort of where we are in terms of of LIBOR. So uh, at the end of at the end of last year, 70% of the LIBOR settings uh, ceased. And so at the moment, for five US dollar LIBOR settings, these are going to continue with the previous method, which is via panel banks until the 30th of June 2023. Um, for six of the sterling and yen LIBORs, you have uh, settings continuing to the end of this year but they are in the form of what's the synthetic LIBOR, which is for all legacy contracts except clear derivatives. And synthetic LIBOR is um, uh, assessed differently, so it's, it's, it's based on a risk-free rate, so not on panel submissions, plus an ISTA spread, which is provided by Bloomberg. So for sterling, um, it is the sterling overnight uh, index average, Sonia, which is administered by the Bank of England. So in moving on then to the, the, the other main reason for, I think, why we haven't started seeing so far um, a, a glut of um, libel um, claims is to do with the further legislation that's been introduced. Um, and then probably the most relevant for the individual on this call are the ones for um, the legislation introduced in the EU, in the UK, um, and, uh, and the US. And as I said earlier, these this legislation is focusing on, on what's deemed the, the tough legacy contracts, which are pre-existing contracts that reference LIBOR, but there's no viable fallback reference rate in the event of LIBOR secession. So this could be the contract itself doesn't even contain a replacement benchmark or the actual, um, or the actual replacement or alternative to LIBOR doesn't make sense as it would require parties to ask other banks for uh, what their LIBOR rates, but that obviously doesn't make sense in circumstances where 
my board has ceased. So the first um, the first legislation that was introduced was in the EU in February uh, last year, and this was an amendment to the um, EU benchmark regulation. And so this allows the EU Commission to select alternative benchmarks for contracts that are governed by EU member states with no fallback provisions. And this um, also has extraterritorial effect. So it's not just EU member state law where it applies. It also applies where the parties are, are based in the US, are based in the EU. Um, we'll come on to the US uh, law in a moment, but the EU law doesn't have any safe harbor provisions with regard to litigation. Um, and, uh, but in, we then move on then to the UK. So what the UK did was <clears throat> in December last year, it introduced a similar bill to the um, EU legislation. And so this provides that references to LIBOR and relevant English law contracts will be interpreted as if they're references to synthetic LIBOR. Um, again, there's no safe harbor provisions for the litigation, unlike the US federal law. Uh, it was discussed in Parliament, but I think the view was taken by the Treasury that restricting parties from asserting potential rights under material adverse change clauses or from otherwise claiming breach or frustration of a contract would in itself have the effect of preventing um, litigation on, 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 on those types of issues. Um, so then the final and the most recent uh, relevant statute was uh, introduced in the US in March of this year. And that's a US federal law that means that instruments using US LIBOR and which are governed by US law will replace LIBOR with a rate based on the secured overnight financing rate. And that will come into effect um, at the, uh, after the 30th of June 2023 when the existing US LIBOR cease. So as I mentioned, this, this does have express provisions for a safe harbour against litigation. So what this means is that if a party replaces LIBOR as per statute, it cannot be sued for that replacement uh, rate or that or, or alternative selection. Uh, and also importantly, the replacement doesn't discharge or excuse performance of the contract. It doesn't justify termination or constitute a, a breach of contract. Um, because it's a federal law, it supersedes um, state laws. So um, New York introduced a similar law in April 2021, and it's going to result in, in, I think, obviously great consistency as to how these issues are dealt with in the US. So moving then briefly on to the potential claims, I think although the volume of the litigation certainly at this stage has been reduced by the um, steps that have been taken, there's obviously still potential risk for dispute. They'll fall, I think, broadly into two categories. So there'll be the existing contracts and then the repapering exercise, um, which is where you're replacing one libel reference contract with a non-libel reference contract. I think in the existing contracts, uh, the likely causes of action are going to be breach of contract, force majeure, frustration, although query the, um, the likelihood of success in this and also the impact of the tough legacy contract legislation, which is trying to seek to limit these types of, of disputes from actually arising. Um, and then on the repapering exercise, this is obviously a negotiation. So there's a usual risk of uh, a dispute arising from that, potentially around uh, arguments about contraption interpretation, potential misrep claims that I know Lucy touched on, on earlier. And then the other obvious area is, is in mis-selling, so mis-selling claims. Um, and that kind of leads on then into the second topic I wanted to talk about, which was um, interest rate claims. So um, I think in this context, there's obviously been an increase um, in interest rates around the world, given the um, rising inflation, the economic outlook. And I think this has led some commentators to suggest that there could be a glut of claims um, against the bank. Um, and the last time we saw a number of these claims um, where there was interest rate volatility was around 10 years ago in the context of the swaps and selling claims. And they obviously generated a significant amount of litigation. But I think it, it, in the context of if there were similar type claims issued now, 
there will be the same types of difficulties that those cases um, faced. Um, and the primary one is probably that the overall duty that the banks owed wasn't significantly expanded by the interest rate hedging swaps claims. Um, so in terms of the claims themselves, interest those claims usually had sort of three broad causes of action. So there was a claim for a breach of statutory duty, there's a claim often for negligent advice, and there was a misrep claim. We've kind of already covered the, the misrep side of things earlier. But on the, the breach of statutory duty, the difficulty here uh, for claimants is that the breach of the relevant section of FISMA only applies to what's termed private persons, which is an individual and not uh, a company. So um, that potentially limits the pool of potential claimants relying on that particular provision. In terms of um, negligent advice, I think that's that's difficult, particularly in light of the Court of Appeal decision in PAG, because it's hard to establish that a duty was owed. There obviously then has to be a clear assumption of a duty to advise, which you may not be able to establish on the facts. Um, and also banks are able to rely on basis clauses, which excludes provisions of advice and has non-reliance clauses. Um, and I think the final the final reason is also that um, the Court of Appeal in PAG kind of sort of dismissed a suggestion that was made in the High Court that there was this mezzanine duty. So um, the court it, it at first instance suggested that there was a spectrum between the Headley Byrne duty not to misstate at one extreme and then an assumption of duty to advise on the other. And they suggested that there was this mezzanine duty that kind of fell in between those two extremes. Um, but that was dismissed in the Court of Appeal. Um, and it, that's obviously um, useful for banks, but obviously not particularly helpful um, for, for claimants. I suppose just one final point, just in terms of, of, of where we are and where things may be going in the future. I think it's probably, use, it's probably important just to note, certainly at this stage, that um, we haven't seen the sort of the rate volatility that we were seeing um, when a lot of the interest rate swaps claims were being made following the credit crunch. So uh, in 2008 to 2009, there was a drop of almost 5%, whereas we've seen an increase of around 1% over a couple of years. So it's not really in the same, in, in the same extent uh, at the moment. That may obviously change as, as, as interest rates rise, but I think at the moment it's not something that we're, that we're seeing. So that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour in terms of potential LIBOR and interest rate what claims. I'm not sure if anyone uh, on the panel had any any questions for me. Um, I, I, I've got one, uh, George. I mean, I, I wonder whether it's uh, it's a. Oh, I'd like to get your view. I've, I've got my view on on kind of how I see this going. But do you think this glut of claims will ever come? I guess is the is, is the question in light of what has come before. In, and I'm, what, what I mean by that is kind of how sort of. Um, let's say there was mixed success in respect of some of these interest rate hedging product uh, claims that were brought against the banks and kind of, you know, there's some some real sort of law that explained kind of what the bank's duty is that you've, you've, you've gone into there. I wonder yeah. whether kind of what, what your, what your take on, on, on it, on it is. I mean, I think, I, I think it's true. I mean, I think, I think where the law probably is means that um, legally there may be a difficulty in terms of actually, bringing those claims. I mean, that in and of itself obviously doesn't mean that there won't actually be these claims that are issued because, I mean, we've talked about it before, but um, the, the lack of actual genuine success going to full trial for a number of claimants on the interest rate hedging product, products doesn't mean that there wasn't a huge number of cases and that a number of those were settled. And obviously it, was, it took up a huge amount of time in terms of how the banks were dealing with things. So, so whilst it may be the case that ultimately they may not succeed at a full trial, uh, I don't know whether that wouldn't in and of itself mean that there aren't going to be people who are issuing claims. 
And then in terms of going back to the LIBOR transition, I mean, as, as I understand it, there, there can be a difference in value. Sometimes it's quite small. But between LIBOR and, and Sonia, uh, you know, as I understand it, Sonia doesn't necessarily sort of break in the, the, the sort of break in the credit spread. So to the extent yeah. that there, there is this mismatch in value, do you think we're going to see any um, you know, compensation or I mean, how's that going to be dealt with? I wonder if it isn't um, through through claims. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right. And I, I think that probably is one way, I, I think, because obviously where the economic impact of the change is significant, then that is obviously going to cause tension between uh, contracting parties. And I think you're right. In that situation, one of the obvious ways in which you can seek redress is to is to threaten to issue proceedings or issue proceedings. So, um, I think you're right. I think that is that is the that's that's where the tension is is really lying. Rose Jasper, did you have anything uh, anything any other questions or points to add here? Well, I think the only point up, up, I would add is very clear from George's uh, uh, lucid presentation that uh, from the perspective of uh, UK PLC or the economy more broadly, the answer in terms of ensuring that there isn't uh, a tsunami of litigation is legislation. And I think that that has uh, uh, overlaps with some of the other areas that we've all uh, uh, touched on. Usually when you have a legislative uh, solution that prevents you know, the contractual and other common law claims from um, uh, you know, being generated uh, and creating the tsunami that we see in, uh, in, in other fields. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And also I think that, that theme did come up in, in a number of the Swartz mis-selling claims as well, is that there was obviously the FCA um, redress scheme. There is obviously a statutory um, uh, ability, as I said, to claim under FISMA for a private person. And in a number of the swaps cases, the courts were obviously trying to find a balance between, uh, and there was a, there seemed to be a general reluctance to actually extend a common law duty even further in circumstances where there is this redress scheme that's going on, and there is also as I said, an ability for a private person to bring uh, to bring a claim directly under FISMA. Just briefly before we move on to discuss this derivatives, I just pick up on one question that's coming from um, from uh, the audience, and do feel free to use the, the chat function to ask questions. But this is concerning the lowballing tapes uh, from 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 the BBC. Um, and, and I would say, I suppose it's, it's not, in a sense, it's not new uh, evidence. It, and sorry, the, the low boiling tapes is, is, is a, a, a documentary um, uh, by Andy Verity, who has uh, sort of found evidence that, in fact, a lot of pressure came from the Bank of England uh, to banks to try and uh, set uh, LIBOR lower than it ought to have been because there was concern about the creditworthiness of the banks and the banks needed to present themselves as being creditworthy. Um, now, we already knew that, actually. We already knew that the manipulation went both ways, that it was both to help the proprietary positions of the traders and also this question of um, this, this question of uh, creditworthiness of the banks. So it's not new information in that sense. Um, but I, yeah, I, think, I think it is clear now that the, the, the Bank of England put an awful lot of pressure on. Um, I suspect it would be very, very difficult to, to see the Bank of England. You wouldn't be able to establish a, a duty of care there. Um, anyway. If anyone else had any thoughts on that, feel feel free to jump in. Um, uh, but otherwise, Jasper, it would be great to hear from you about the uh, about the uh, is the is the contract. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Lucy. Um, so for for the audience, I've been tasked with scanning the horizon to identify the future or disputes concerning derivatives governed by the International Swaps and Derivatives Association Master Agreement otherwise commonly referred to as the ISDA uh, Master Agreement. And uh, I think that the immense significance of these sorts of disputes is captured by Mr Justice Briggs, as he then was in the Lomas and Firth Rickson decision, when he described the ISDA Master Agreement as, quotes, probably the most important standard market agreement used in the financial world. Now, that significance 
uh, apart from the fact that the ISDA master agreement is the standard form uh, uh, agreement used for uh, OTC uh, derivatives, it is the fact of the, or the size of this global market for derivatives that are traded over the counter is absolutely vast. According to ISDA, at the end of June 2021, the notional outstanding for OTC derivatives stood at US dollars $610 trillion. And the gross value of those derivatives totaled US dollars $12.6 trillion. So it should be clear uh, from this summary how systemically important the ISDA Master Agreement is to the banking and financial world. And the ISDA Master Agreement has particular significance for English lawyers because the most commonly chosen system of law for the ISDA Master Agreement is English law. I believe that still pertains uh, even after uh, uh, Brexit. And certainly the position prior to Brexit was that um, the absolute vast majority, I think in excess of 90% of all EU and EEA counterparty derivatives, uh, OTC derivatives were uh, uh, selected English law. And uh, I'm not aware that that has materially changed post uh, Brexit. And that all of that, the size of the market and the frequency with which English law is chosen, uh, is uh, or provides the explanation why the commercial court, the English commercial court, and now the financial list is probably the world's leading judicial authority on the meaning and application and enforcement of rights under the ISDA uh, Master Agreement. And I think it's just important um, before I move on, just to make it clear to the audience that the disputes that I'm focusing on here are quite distinct from the disputes that uh, George and uh, uh, Lucy uh, uh, have been talking about, which may touch on uh, uh, instruments that are governed by the Easter Master Agreement, because those disputes don't usually concern the contractual rights within the ISDA Master Agreement. When you're talking about mis-selling claims or claims in negligence or all the like, you, you are bolting on extra contractual claims in respect of transactions. But what I'm focused on here is the internal operation of the ISDA Master Agreement itself with respect to transactions. And generally speaking, that's going to be um, uh, parties who are involved in wholesale markets rather than uh, retail uh, uh, markets. And that's also why, in one sense, there, there isn't, uh, as you sometimes see in the mis-selling claims, uh, 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 legal market, a sort of a claimant side and a defendant side, in relation to the, the disputes I'm talking about, uh, of course, there is a buy side and a sell side, but generally speaking, um, uh, you can be a claimant or a defendant, uh, depending on how the transaction uh, uh, has panned out. So what, what I want to do this morning um, it, it is highlight at a relatively high level of generality the areas where I think is the disputes are likely to proliferate. Now, if you were looking for more granular thoughts about, I just pluck an example out of the air, but the future of the law on the closeout mechanism in the 2002 um, master agreement form, then I'm happy to address those types of granular questions if uh, anyone's interested in the answers uh, in the Q&A. But for the moment, I want to concentrate on broad themes. In one sense, the single theme that I think is applicable to predict uh, the future for ISDA disputes is uh, to look for uh, upheaval and disruption in financial markets. And whenever you see that, you will see shortly thereafter uh, disputes under the uh, ISDA Master Agreement, because that, that, that is what history tells us. Whenever that occurs, uh, ISDA disputes are likely to follow. My first case in practice, in 1992, in, uh, when I was in New York, was the um, almost uh, bankruptcy of um, Salomon Brothers uh, in the uh, then famous Treasury bond auction scandal and a proliferation of multi-billion uh, cross-US uh, disputes that arose out of that. And uh, uh, if it wasn't for the bailout by Warren Buffett, then Salomon Brothers would have been the first 
uh, Wall Street Investment Bank uh, that went bankrupt. Uh, and as we know, um, that honor went to uh, uh, Lehman Brothers. And of course, we're all, uh, I think, well aware of the enormous uh, fallout uh, from that bankruptcy, in particular, the proliferation of disputes under the Easter Master Agreement. Um, but, but again, uh, one goes back to the Sage of Omaha when, whenever one is looking for insight here. And as he famously said, Warren Buffett, that is, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. Now, I can't say who's been skinny dipping, but we can see the most recent market upheavals and consider what are the prospects that they will give rise to ISTA disputes. Now, one obvious uh, uh, upheaval that we've seen in the financial world is Brexit. And I think it's fair to say that um, we haven't seen a proliferation of uh, uh, disputes arising out of uh, Brexit. They've been relatively sporadic, and that in part has been because uh, ISDA has responded, there's been a regulatory response, and obviously a, a legislative uh, response uh, to, to Brexit to uh, reduce what might otherwise have been the scope of uh, disputes arising as a result of Brexit. But nev nevertheless, there are a number of contractual issues that might be seen uh, in the future by the courts. Uh, what, one issue that one can just take by way of example is what, what is the impact of uh, Brexit, in particular the UK's uh, departure from uh, the uh, uh, Brussels-Lugano uh, 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 regulation, the, the, the suite of uh, jurisdiction and judgment conventions we have with the EU. What is the impact of that on the choice of English jurisdiction in the uh, ISDA master agreement where the parties to the relevant agreement are established in the EU? I'm not going to say uh, any more on that topic um, other than to simply flag it, given that there's a real prospect that I'll be addressing the English court on that very issue in the not too distant future. But since uh, Brexit, uh, we've seen rising inflation. Uh, we have seen uh, recently rising interest rates, and I think it uh, must be common ground that uh, we haven't seen uh, the full extent of those rising interest rates yet. And we've seen volatile equity markets. And all of that market dislocation is likely to give rise to margin calls if they are not already uh, coming as we speak. Uh, uh, and then margin calls, which are not able to be met uh, because of those rising interest rates, because of the inflation, because of equity um, uh, uh, volatility, will then give rise to events of default and or termination events. And then you have designations of termination by the uh, non-defaulting party, and then finally close out to terminations, all of which may well be disputed. Now, there is a reasonable amount of case law to guide on those issues. Uh, and I'm going to just mention the latest guidance from the Commercial Court on the approach to close out determinations under the 2002 Master Agreement. Uh, which is the decision of Mr. Justice Knowles in uh, Lehman, Lehman Brothers Special Finance and the National Power Corporation of the Philippines, a case close to my heart, uh, where I represented the National Power Corporation. Uh, that decision, and certainly the reasoning, hasn't met universal approval, uh, certainly from many uh, banks and financial institutions, uh, because the 2002 agreement has been interpreted as giving more scope for the defaulting party to dispute a close-out determination that is available to the defaulting party under the 1992 uh, agreement. The leading case there is the uh, NSARCO and uh, Lehman Brothers case, uh, another one I was fortunate to be involved in. And that may well, that dissonance between the 92 form and the 2002 form and whether the narrowing uh, uh, under the 92 form is actually uh, the better approach for the 2002 form. That could be an area for review uh, if, if the issue again reaches the commercial court or the court of appeal. One other obvious uh, uh, area of financial upheaval is the financial sanctions on Russia and um, uh, entities and persons connected with uh, uh, Russia. Now, all of that is going to have and is having 
significant impact on interest rate swaps, uh, uh, um, FX derivatives, credit derivatives, commodity derivatives, and equity derivatives. All of those markets are, are, are being significantly affected. And these sanctions create a number of key risks for parties to ISDA uh, master agreements, uh, uh, who, who have agreements with either sanctioned entities or entities that are controlled or affiliated to sanctioned uh, entities. And those risks include restrictions on terminating, restrictions on transferring or unwinding derivatives. You have restrictions on enforcing collateral arrangements, uh, and uh, uncertainty over the scope of prohibited activities that might prevent ordinary trading activity. Now, sanctions regulators have generally issued guidance uh, intended to address those risks and on occasion have given authorizations to mitigate the impact of sanctions on specific transactions. Uh, but these are, of course, ad hoc and they are not consistent across the US, UK and EU sanctions regimes. There is a huge amount of uh, detail here and ISDA has issued its own proposals to reduce uncertainty and to mitigate the impact of sanctions. But it may well be the case that guidance could be sought um, from uh, the financial list, uh, perhaps even using the test case uh, procedure where it is impossible to gain that adequate degree of uh, guidance and certainty from the sanctions regime, the guidance under the sanctions regime, or from the regulators themselves. A different type of market upheaval, which is perhaps more looking into uh, my metaphoric crystal ball, is the market upheaval that uh, comes from the rise of crypto derivatives. Um, and in other words, uh, derivatives that derive their value from crypto assets. Now, it's very difficult to deny the potential for crypto assets to reshape financial markets. <clears throat> crypto assets have emerged from being a somewhat fringe retail product to becoming a sophisticated financial market with rising demand for crypto assets from uh, all sorts of institutional investors. And um, that market is estimated by ISDA recently to have a value already of $3 trillion. I think it, for, for those who are not familiar with crypto assets, it may be useful just to seek to answer the very basic question, what is a crypto uh, asset? Now, the complexity and the novelty of new forms, and there are constantly new forms of crypto assets that are being produced, means that there can't be any comprehensive definition because ultimately it's the rules of the system in which the crypto asset exists, which defines what is a crypto asset. But in general terms, and at its core, a crypto asset is an electronic payment system which is based on cryptographic proof and uses digital tokens. This is very different from traditional, uh, what are called fiat currencies uh, issued by governments and in which financial institutions serve as the exclusive trusted third parties. Typically, a crypto asset is represented by a pair of data parameters, one which is public and disclosed to all participants, which contains coded information about the asset and then a private data parameter known as the private key, which permits transfers or other dealings in the asset to be cryptographically uh, authenticated by a digital signature. Knowledge of this private key confers practical control over the crypto asset, and then dealings in the crypto asset are broadcast to a network of participants in the relevant system, and then once confirmed as valid, they are added to a digital ledger. The main function of the ledger is to keep a reliable history of transactions and so prevent double spending. In other words, inconsistent transfers of the same crypto asset to different recipients. And then the ledger may be distributed and decentralized. In other words, shared over a network with no one person responsible for maintaining it. So a common type of distributed ledger uses a blockchain which comprises blocks of transactions linked together sequentially, but there are other models uh, than blockchain which are in use. 
And so an important feature of some systems is that the rules governing dealings are established by informal consensus of participants rather than by contract or some other legally binding way. And in practice, these rules are self-enforcing because only transactions made in compliance with them and entered into the ledger will be accepted by participants as valid. So that's my whistle stop tour uh, attempt to try and uh, describe at least uh, the essence of a crypto asset. Perhaps the most fundamental legal issue for crypto assets is whether they are in fact a form of property, albeit a novel form of property. Now this is incredibly important because unless crypto assets are property, they will not be recognized against the whole world. Uh, rather than being personal rights, only recognized against a person who's assumed a relevant legal duty. And proprietary rights are, of course, absolutely critical for recognition in insolvency, uh, where, where they, if they are property rights, have priority over um, unsecured creditors, and also uh, the, the, the proprietary rights and whether they exist in crypto assets is incredibly important to whether or not they can um, uh, amount to security. Uh, security interests can be taken in them uh, and whether crypto assets can be held on trust. And th this question, whether they can be property, it is a theme that I think has been ever present <clears throat> in relation to the digital world generally. Wherever we have uh, digitally uh, issued um, uh, uh, products, and one can think of uh, everything from ebooks to music to film to computer software which is no longer tangible, so you don't have a physical book, but which is effectively uh, data uh, passed on uh, via networks of computers, that has raised these profound questions about, well, is it still property? Because the common law and most systems of law generally, historically, have regarded uh, property as uh, being confined to tangible items. Uh, and by and large, uh, so, so, some uh, uh, jurisdictions have uh, adapted to these novel forms uh, of um, uh, product, and uh, there's also been legislative uh, in intervention uh, on occasion. So far, at least under English law, whilst there was, uh, of course, initial uncertainty about whether crypto assets could be property, uh, very helpfully, a UK jurisdictional task force that was led by uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss, uh, now the Master of the Rolls, in 2019 issued guidance. Uh, and the guidance was to the effect that crypto assets have all of the indicia of property. Uh, the novel features of some crypto assets, such as intangibility, the cryptographic authentication, the use of a distributed transaction ledger, decentralization, rule by consensus that I've described, according to the task force, does not disqualify them from being property, and crypto assets are not disqualified from being property as pure information or because they might not be classified as tangible or indeed a show's in action. Uh, of course, this is uh, provisional, but there has been some uh, case, le case law where in the context of injunctions on a provisional basis, um, uh, blockchain, uh, 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 sorry, bit Bitcoin has been uh, treated as um, uh, property, uh, and also there have been some other jurisdictions that have referred to the UK Jurisdictional Task Force with approval. So there seems to be a consensus gathering that um, uh, crypto assets uh, are, are not disqualified from being uh, property. Uh, there are, though, uh, important areas where the legal status of crypto assets have not been finally resolved. Uh, and, and certainly is up in the air. And for example, is crypto or are crypto assets property for the purpose of the financial collateral arrangements? Uh, and it may well be that, uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, the legislative solution is probably the cleanest and most certain uh, solution in this area, but we'll have to wait and see whether that um, uh, arises. And if not, then I foresee that um, there may well be hotly disputed uh, issues in relation to that, uh, that may well reach the financial list. I mean, I think it, it's relatively clear 
that the current form of the ISDA master agreement, whether it's the 92 form or the 2002 form, does not easily accommodate crypto assets uh, as reference assets, and that's no surprise. Um, the prevailing approach uh, apparently appears to be to use an amalgam of commodity derivative uh, de definitions, equity derivative definitions, and bespoke terms. But there are a number of ISDA provisions which could give rise to disputes in relation to crypto derivatives. Uh, what one example is the index disruption, index adjustment event provisions, which don't cater for the role of a decentralized exchange, which relies on distributed ledgers rather than a centralized uh, index exchange and a central index administrator. The second example I can give is that the current credit support annex to the master agreement does not readily account for the novel issues that arise in relation to crypto assets, which may be held in custody in all sorts of different novel forms of crypto assets, um, forks and all sorts of things, um, which um, don't really easily come within the existing terms of the credit support annex. And then thirdly, perhaps most importantly, there is some unhappiness with the valuation mechanics of Section 6E of the Master Agreement, which deals with the closeout uh, mechanism and how they apply to crypto derivatives. Just one example, um, the accuracy and reliability of quotations from third parties uh, may well be question, have been questioned in the past, even in relation to what might be relatively straightforward derivatives. But when you get to crypto derivatives and crypto markets where there is fragmented liquidity in the relevant underlying, it is likely that it will be highly questionable whether or not a third party quotation is uh, reliable. And of course, once you get that, then disputes will never be uh, uh, far behind. So what, whilst it may well be open to participants to adopt a completely bespoke approach to documenting a crypto derivative, I think ISDA anticipating all of this uh, have issued a white paper, I think it was last year, which itself will almost certainly at some stage will lead to the issue of standardized terms addressing a contractual framework to address uh, these sorts of issues in OTC crypto derivatives. However, I suspect in the meantime, this ever expanding market for crypto derivatives that have been documented on the current standard is to form may well require resol resolution of the issues that I have highlighted. I think I've spoken uh, enough, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, that, that is one of the really impressive features of ISDA, isn't it, that they're, that they're able to put in these protocols that, uh, that, that that help adapt. I mean, we've seen that in LIBOR transition as well. Uh, and I think it provides a, it provides a lot of certainty to the market and really and really and really helps. I actually have I do have a question for you. And this has always been a particular bugbear of mine. Um, and, 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 and it'd be interesting, given your involvement in national power, your views on this. Uh, and that is this, the, the, in is the closeout disputes, this requirement for reasonableness. Uh, and and uh, and quite some time ago, I was involved in the case of Unicredit versus Barclays, where we were discussing this, this question of reasonableness. And the court really determined that reasonableness in the commercial contract meant Wendersbury reasonableness and was really very, very low bar. And I get I get the impression that perhaps in the context of the 2002 um, is to close out uh, uh, provisions, that the, the bar set just a little bit higher in terms of the reasonableness. Um, I don't I don't know if you have any uh, any any thoughts on on that. Well, I think the the short answer is I do. Uh, the long answer is how long of what? Because this is incredibly <laughs> naughty. This is incredibly <laughs> naughty. Uh, a very fascinating um, uh, issue. Uh, g given the time constraints, I think I can probably answer it this way. Uh, as you say, the 1992, and I tried to touch on this in the talk, but the 1992 um, uh, uh, market quotation um, uh, uh, section six mechanism has been authoritatively construed, the concept of reasonableness as importing a discretion for the uh, uh, 
uh, non-defaulting party to determine what the appropriate closeout uh, um, um, amount is. Um, and the scope of that discretion is constrained by, uh, uh, is, a, is a Wednesbury discretion, subject to Wednesbury unreasonableness. And uh, the, the perhaps controversial element of the National Power Corporation case is when, uh, and I argued that uh, there ought not to be a different approach, it wasn't intended to make it easier for a defaulting party to challenge a closeout determination. Mr Justice Knowles considered that, there, that the Wednesbury unreasonableness standard was not included within the slightly amended wording in the 2002 form and that there was a uh, more objective um, uh, approach to reasonableness. So, so there was less scope for the non-defaulting uh, party. His solution was, uh, I think, that ultimately once you get a dispute uh, there's, uh, and it gets to court, it, it really isn't at that stage, once you get to court, for the non-defaulting party, if they've made a mistake, to go again. It, it's ultimately for the court to decide, and the court needs to have some kind of objective test in mind in order to come up with the right number. Uh, uh, from recollection, and I may, may be right about this, you mentioned the Unicredit and Barclays case. Um, I believe that Robin Knowles QC was uh, representing, I think, uh, the losing party in um, at that case. Yes, so, yes he was, with, with, uh, working with me. <laughs> yes. uh, and so I'm pretty certain, pretty confident that his experience in that case uh, had some uh, influence in his approach uh, in the National that's Power Commission. That, that, that's that's, what I, that's the reason why I say uh, uh, I think that um, parties that are closing out, I think we generally prefer the the approach of Enesarco and um, the 1992 uh, agreement, where they have uh, only to, to get it right according to the Wednesbury standard. Um, and I, I think certainly there is scope for revisiting um, the uh, the heightened sta uh, standard that um, that uh, National Power Incorporation suggests is right. Well, I find this, this topic fascinating, but I don't want to get lost entirely in it. So I wonder if we can um, move on maybe to Ros and shifting gears a little bit. Um, are we going to talk about uh, the, the Quince Care duty and some push payment fraud? Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, so I'm covering two topics, which, as we'll see in a moment, are related. The renaissance of the Quince Care duty and also developments in the law concerning authorised push payment fraud. So, as I'm sure you all know, just a quick primer on Quince Care, it's the duty in negligence that arises on banks where uh, the bank has reasonable grounds to suspect that uh, the customer is being defrauded uh, and when it's asked to make a payment. And when that duty arises, the bank is under uh, an obligation not to make the payment and to take appropriate action. Uh, now, that the, the problem for banks, uh, and this has been recognised by the court, is that uh, the bank's primary duty is, of course, to pay out on its customers' instructions. And in the classic situation, what you have is uh, the agent of the customer approaches the bank, and it's somebody who is authorised within the mandate uh, given to the customer by the bank to, to give instructions. Uh, but... As I say, in the classic situation, that person who approaches the bank is actually defrauding uh, its employer or its other partners uh, and issuing payment instructions in pursuance of that fraud, for example, to a personal account. Uh, and be but because of that difficulty, that the, that the bank is potentially placed in a position of conflict between uh, its primary duty to pay out valid instructions and its duty to stop its customer being defrauded, the courts have traditionally said that the Quince Care duty should be fairly narrowly construed. It's just been described as carefully calibrated. Uh, and uh, despite that, as, as I'll show in a moment, there's there's been some activism recently around the duty, certainly in the last five years or so. And the scope of the duty, I think, probably has expanded beyond where it uh, originally started. So Quince Care was the first case when the duty was formally recognised. Uh, it was a decision actually in 1988, but it wasn't reported on until 1992. 
And that was followed immediately by uh, the Lipkin-Gorman case, which is uh, well known, went to the House of Lords, although not on this issue. But it was confirmed at Court of Appeal level that, that the duty uh, existed. Uh, although, actually, in neither of those cases, although the courts recognised the existence of the duty, neither claimant was successful because the court found in each case that the bank wasn't actually on notice. And I think we then really have a period of hiatus, and there are relatively few quince care cases in the 1990s and the first decade of this century. Uh, and the quince care duty actually has remained quite controversial. There's a respected academic opinion. Um, my colleague in chambers, Professor Peter Watts, who's uh, one of the authors of Barrister and Reynolds, has a very strongly held view that the quince care duty is fundamentally wrong because it conflicts, as I've said, with the bank's primary duty to pay out. And he's written uh, academically uh, in, in, on that topic, saying, arguing quite strongly that, it, that it's an aberration and shouldn't exist. And so it's not actually until uh, we get to the Singularis decision that was uh, at first instance in 2017 that a claimant actually succeeded. Uh, and that decision is, is, I think, important for that reason. And also because the, that case ended up going to the Supreme Court, where I think it's fair to say the existence of the duty has now been put beyond any, any doubt. Uh, and we have a fairly strong statement from the Supreme Court in Singularis about the policy of the duty being to combat financial crime uh, and so on. And so they found uh, they rejected the bank's appeal. Uh, and the first instance, uh, just the success of the claimant uh, has, has stood. And since the Singularis decision, actually the duty's been to the Supreme Court, the Privy Council, twice more. Uh, we've seen the Stanford International case. Uh, which has been argued, but decision has not yet been handed down. Uh, and in fact, topically, uh, there is a decision of the Privy Council due to be handed down uh, in about an hour uh, in the uh, the case of somewhat unsnappily named JPSPC4 versus Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, which is a decision um, from the Isle of Man Court of Appeal. So I think it is possible to see that Singularis case as the beginning of a, of a period of, of probably fairly claimant-friendly decisions uh, since 2017. I'm going to mention a couple of them now. One of them is the case of the Federal Republic of Nigeria versus J.P. Morgan. It was a case that I argued um, for the bank, and it's, it was a strikeout decision uh, against a claim brought by the Federal Republic, who was a customer of the bank, and had asked the bank to open a, a, a special purpose escrow account to give effect to a settlement uh, of various litigations and disputes arising from an oil field. Uh, and the new government, the new regime in Nigeria came along after the event and said, well, actually that was all a, a gigantic fraud and the payment should never have been made to, uh, to the recipient party because they were never entitled to the oil assets in the first place. And the bank argued a strikeout on the basis of the contractual terms in the retainer. And there were some fairly uh, strong terms in that agreement, for example, a term which precluded uh, any duties other than those which arose on the express terms of the agreement. Uh, and the bank argued that, that those terms precluded any quince care duty. Um, but that argument failed. There was no strikeout. Uh, and the court, the first instance, and the Court of Appeal have confirmed that you need clear words in the contract if you're going to exclude the quince care duty. So I think it's fair to say it's fairly difficult to uh, exclude that duty contractually, although you can do it if you have clear enough words. Um, that case has therefore proceeded to a full trial, which took place before Easter in front of Mrs. Justice Cockrell, and uh, we await the judgment uh, in that. The second case, which is the one that really straddles my two topics, is called Philip and Barclays Bank. Uh, and that was a case where the claimant had been the victim of an authorised push payment fraud. As I'm sure you all know, that's the sort of fraud where the customer is duped by a third party into making a payment uh, to a fraudster. 
Uh, and so normally the customer thinks that they are paying the funds to a legitimate third party for services or, or for some other reason. But in fact, the account is controlled by the fraudster who makes off with the money. So in that case, Mrs. Phillip was the victim of a very elaborate scam in which she was approached by somebody no doubt very plausible who claimed to be from the National Crime Agency uh, and said that she and her husband were at risk of being targeted by fraudsters and that they needed to transfer substantial sums of money to an account uh, in the UAE. So she went through all the relevant security procedures and, and in fact, she was so taken in by the fraudsters that she lied. Uh, she and her husband lied to the bank about whether uh, they'd had previous dealings with the recipient of the money, uh, and they transferred £700,000 to those accounts. Now, this was different from all of the previous decided Quince Care cases, because the previous cases have all involved a situation of what we might call internal fraud, which is where an agent of the bank's customer, so for example, the partner of the law firm in Lipkin Gorman, is defrauding his principal by approaching the bank and asking the bank to transfer money uh, out. The APP situation is different because it's an external fraud. There's no question that the customer does intend to make the payment, but they are being defrauded by a third party uh, completely outside the relationship between the customer and the bank. And so in Philip, the bank applied to strike out the claim uh, on the basis that it didn't fall within the Quince Care duty at all, um, because in, in essence, uh, Mrs. Philip had, had in always, always intended the payment. She wasn't being defrauded in the way that the claimants in earlier Quince Care cases was that argument actually succeeded at first instance, but was overturned by the Court of Appeal, who said that the Quince Care duty wasn't actually limited in this way, uh, and they have sent the case back for trial, although there is an application pending to the Supreme Court. Now, I think this is an important decision if, if it survives, because uh, it does potentially expand the duty into APP fraud, where it has not previously um, being successfully argued. Uh, and as we all know, APP fraud is definitely on the rise. I don't have the statistics, but it's easy to imagine that APP fraud is much more prevalent than the scenario of internal fraud uh, that I've talked about where uh, the customer is being defrauded by a director or an employee or a partner. And the effect of the Philip case, if it survives, is that these claims can't be struck out uh, and there is the possibility of, of, a, of a dramatic increase in first instance claims where claimants are going to seek to hold the bank accountable, where, for example, they're tricked into handing over their login details or transferring money to fraudsters. Now, that floodgates argument was run by the bank in the Court of Appeal, uh, but it didn't persuade them. Uh, it's also relevant to consider what other remedies there are uh, either currently or on the horizon for APP fraud, uh, and I'll come back. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, one other decision uh, which uh, is worth mentioning in the APP situation is uh, a case called IFT Offshore versus Barclays, which was a case where the claimant had been also the victim of APP fraud and had sought a Norwich Pharmacal order against Barclays. So it wasn't a customer of Barclays. Barclays was the bank to which the fraudster um, had transferred the money. So the claimant wanted to see where the money had gone uh, in order to see whether it had any chance of getting it back. And uh, having received that information, the claimant then wanted to think about issuing a claim against Barclays as the receiving bank. And uh, the uh, because of the terms of the Norwich Farm Court, they were permission to do that. And uh, they sought uh, permission from um, the commercial court in order to obtain uh, the right to use those documents in a potential claim against Barclays. And the bank unsurprisingly argued that uh, there was no question of a duty of care in this case because, of course, Quince Care normally arises only in the relationship between the banker and the customer. Claimant was not a customer of Barclays. But uh, Mr Justice Burton gave permission. He said he could see that there were difficulties with uh, that claim and, in particular, the existence of a duty of care. 
but the right course was to allow permission, uh, let the claim be brought and then deal with the question of arguability at, at a strikeout or summary judgment. So I think we are seeing something of a renaissance, starting with that singularity decision in 2017. Uh, having never been to the Supreme Court, it has now been uh, three times in the last five years. We are seeing new claims uh, in which the parties are pushing the boundaries of the duty. And I think it's not currently clear where that boundary is, is going to end up, what is going to happen in relation to the Philip decision. Why are we seeing this renaissance? Well, uh, as I say, there must be some encouragement um, from the successful claim in Quint's care. I think, uh, to state the obvious, it's an easier claim to establish than equivalent sorts of claims like dishonest assistance. We see that in Singularis itself. The claimant in that case actually brought parallel claims in dishonest assistance and Quint's care, but didn't succeed in establishing the relevant mental state on the part of the bank in relation to the, to the first claim. So it's an easier claim to establish uh, than dishonest assistance. There's also a, a theme running through some of these cases, which is um, uh, Mrs. Justice Rose, as she was, decided the first instance claim in Singularis. She was on the Court of Appeal panel that um, rejected my appeal in the JP Morgan case. And now she's on the Supreme Court. She has sat on the uh, Stanford International case and also on the Royal Bank of Scotland Isle of Man decision I just mentioned. So uh, I think she, fair to say, she has a particular interest in this in this topic. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what the judgment of the Supreme Court and the Privy Council is going to be in those two outstanding cases. Uh, and then just to follow on from what Jasper was saying about um, uh, digital assets and Bitcoin, there has been an attempt to expand the Quince Care duty into that space um, to cover the management of those digital currency assets. So there's a case this year called Tulip Trading versus Bitcoin Association, uh, which was a jurisdiction dispute. And the claimant in that case uh, was the says it was the owner of very substantial Bitcoin assets. But what had happened was that its systems had been hacked you may recall that Jasbir was talking about the public uh, public information and the private key in relation to digital currency assets. And, and the hackers stole the private key, which permitted the assets to be dealt with. The developers were the software uh, developer, the defendants were the software developers or um, the persons who otherwise controlled the software in relation to those networks. And so the claimants brought a claim seeking a, a suite of relief, trying to regain control of their assets. So sort of mandatory declaratory relief, attempting to force the claimants, uh, the defense essentially to, to hand over or, or find a way to give them back control over their assets. And they were trying to serve those uh, defendants out of the jurisdiction. So there was the question of serious issue to be tried. So essentially the summary judgment test. Uh, and the judge in that case found that the claim didn't pass that test. Uh, and one of the arguments that the claimants had tried was that the defendants owed a tortious duty akin to Quint's care in failing to protect parties like the claimant against fraud uh, or, or a duty to take positive action to ensure that they had access to their own assets. But the judge was unpersuaded by the analogy with Quint's care. And as I touched on earlier, the Quint's care duty is normally only owed to the bank's customer, not to a wider class. Uh, and in the Bitcoin situation, there is no contractual relationship between the developers, the, the defendants that were, that were sought to be served out, uh, and the acquirers of Bitcoin assets. So obviously one of the factors which influenced the judge in that case uh, is that if there were to be a duty akin to Quint's care, it would be owed to a potentially unlimited class of people, which obviously goes far beyond what uh, was intended by the Quint's care duty. So just to finish up then, uh, what is the effect, uh, likely effect of Philip? And where are we going to go with APP frauds and litigation? Well, uh, although at first blush, the, the, the Philip decision is, I think, definitely a, a, an expansion of Quint's care, the effect of it may not be as profound as all that. Uh, and the main reason for that is that most of the main institutions, payment, payment institutions, which includes most of the principal high street banks, 
have already signed up to the voluntary code. This is known as the CRM code, the Contingent Reimbursement Model Code, uh, under which the signatories agree to take reasonable steps to prevent APP fraud happening in the first place, but most significantly to reimburse customers who've been the victim of an APP fraud, unless the bank can show that the customer hasn't acted appropriately, for example, by ignoring warnings or, or paying without a reasonable basis to believe that the, the payment request was genuine. So in a sense, the burden of proof is on the banks um, if they want to resist reimbursing the customer. Uh, and actually, there's been a recent uh, consultation paper by the payment services regulator as to how this code is working and what it should do in the future. Uh, they're not very happy with the overall level of reimbursement because they they say that it's less than 50 percent and they point out that it's unlikely that uh, half of all customers are not acting appropriately so they're they're dissatisfied with the way that this code is working and they are minded to take steps to mandate uh, reimbursement to customers in the case of APP fraud. Uh, they actually need primary legislation to do that, so they're, they're, that may take a while to bring that in. But definitely the mood music is towards making uh, reimbursement of customers mandatory. Uh, now, that didn't help. The code didn't help Mrs Phillip for two reasons, because her payments predated the coming into force of the code, which was May 2019. And also the code only covers payments made within the UK and because her payment was made out of the jurisdiction, she, she wasn't covered. But I think it's fair to say that, that, um, that the direction of travel is very much towards making reimbursement compulsory uh, and uh, that is likely to reduce the impact of the Philip decision, uh, which I think otherwise might have been quite significant at first instance level. So. Uh, unless you have the sort of situation like you have in Philip with an international payment or a payment that predates May 2019, uh, that the Quince Care um, revival will be less important, but it will continue to apply to those cases. So that was all I had to say on those two topics. I mean, it, it, does, it does place quite an extraordinary burden on the banks, really, doesn't it? So we know that APP fraud is on on the rise and we all see it you know in our in our lives I, I feel like it's almost a daily basis uh, you know it, it, I do question how the banks are going to manage this I don't know if they can insure it or if we've given up all hope altogether of actually going after the fraudsters here um, who seem to to get away scot-free I don't, I don't know what the answer is there yeah no I agree and I uh, I think I think it's uh, the burden of proof issue is really important because it's actually, uh, it's not obvious to me at least where the balance should lie between, um, you know, that the, some of these frauds are incredibly uh, persuasive, like the one in, in the Philip case, but some of them you hear about what people have done and, and you think, well, that was, that was really imprudent and you've ignored all the warnings. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's, I think it's very difficult, I agree, very difficult for banks. I fear, I fear the burden is going to increasingly be put on us and it will become more and more and more onerous to actually try and transfer money anywhere as we have to jump through all these hoops and answer all these I questions. think that's, that's absolutely inevitable. And actually, when you read this, this uh, consultation paper, a lot of the focus is on preventing it happening in the first place yeah. for obvious reasons. So I, I think that we can inevitably see that for sure. Um, yeah, and I was just picking up on the um, on the point that you made about the sophistication in in Philip, because um, I think it is one also a potential area in terms of where the cases go. Because the the two decisions you mentioned, J.P. Morgan and and Philip, they're obviously they're obviously just on strikeouts, so there hasn't been a determination on the facts. But in Philip, there was. I think, am I right in saying that some policemen went round and there was a suggestion that they were actually, um, that they, they were on notice of the fraud. So, I mean, what more could the banks have actually done in that situation? Because if they say to a customer, are you sure you want to make this payment? And they say yes. I mean, even if they're, I mean, obviously there's a question, is they're on notice? But I mean, realistically, what more can the banks be doing? 
I think that's a really fair point. And actually, you know, who knows what's going to happen when that goes back to trial? Because all the Court of Appeal have decided is you don't you don't automatically fail just because it's an external fraud, not an yeah. internal fraud. So that's the only um, ratio of that decision. So you're absolutely right. And I think we can all see that there are difficulties. I mean, the, in, in the Philip case, the fraudsters were so persuasive that they managed to convince the Phillips that, that when the police came to visit them, they should lie to yeah. police because they, um, you know, the, 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 the National Crime Agency that he was purporting to represent was sort of outranked the police and, and they, should, they should ignore the, um, uh, the approaches of the police. So, I mean, the facts are really pretty, pretty extraordinary in that case. And I, and I agree, what, what more could the bank do? I mean, the other aspect of the Philip case is that, that takes it outside normal quince care is that it's really about systems and controls because it's saying, well, um, not so much that the bank was on notice, but more that it should have had software or it should have had systems in place that flagged this uh, and 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 should have caused the bank to intervene in in a in a more thoroughgoing way, um, which is not really on all fours with with the traditional quince care model, which is you know you're on notice. But the, the traditional quince care model is based on you know the the situation in the sort of 1980s where you had mm -hmm. a personal relationship with your bank, you'd go in to pay a check, you'd say hello to the manager, you know, which just, we all know just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and that, and I mean, it comes back to your point as well. I mean, that may be why these types of cases that are on the increase is that there is some sympathy from the courts as to how sophisticated these forces are now becoming, because, you know, if you're saying that they're almost getting to the stage where they're impersonating or appearing to impersonate, NCA, FCA individuals, that is a huge change from the initial fraud, uh, what you're talking about in Quinscare or alleged fraud. Yeah. I'm just conscious of, of time and uh, and uh, really want to hear from Ian on, on a very uh, interesting topic of, of ESG and financial services. So, Ian, why don't you go ahead? Um, th thanks very much, Lucy. I think I think it's fair to say that it is an uh, an interesting, uh, albeit quite wide ranging topic. So just in the in the time available, I will kind of try and canter through kind of what uh, I see the sort of key issues are um, and kind of where this is all going potentially. Um, so yeah, as, as as Lucy mentioned at the beginning, my name's Ian Bean. I'm uh, part of the dispute resolution team at uh, Greenberg Traurig in, in in London, and I'm going to be spending a bit of time uh, in this session just discussing ESG issues uh, in a banking disputes context, which I think is fair to say is kind of coming to the forefront of uh, litigators' minds as a result of of this greater focus on environmental and and social issues and and how they're thought to kind of impact on uh, those who operate in the finance and uh, banking space. So I think during this session, I'm going to focus on three areas. So first, um, I'm going to provide a bit of background around the term greenwashing um, and explain the risks to companies, um, financial institutions who seek to classify products or investments as green or sustainable. Um, then I'm going to seek to explain how the regulator and the, the UK government is seeking to, to, to police a company's ESG reporting and, and ESG matters more generally. And then I'm going to conclude by providing an outline of the possible claims that could arise from possible greenwashing and various other ESG uh, related issues. So I think the first question to consider is, is what is meant by the term greenwashing? And I think the answer to that or uh, well, the short answer to that is it, um, it's the process of conveying a false impression of providing misleading information about how a company's products are more environmentally sound, or it's also considered to be an unsubstantiated claim to deceive consumers uh, into believing that a company's products are environmentally friendly in some way. So I think in a finance context, um, the FCA have uh, provided a number of examples as to behaviours of uh, certain regulated entities uh, that could be described as greenwashing. I think the first um, related to a fund um, which had ESG-related 
um, uh, had an ESG related name and uh, they found that to be misleading on the basis that the fund was actually looking to track an index that did not hold itself out to be ESG focused. Um, the second um, example uh, provided by the FCA was uh, a fund that claimed to have a strategy to invest in companies contributing to a positive environmental impact. And I think it was intended that this fund would invest in predominantly companies that were that while reporting low carbon emissions would not obviously contribute to, to a net tra uh, zero transition. I think in this case, the FCA was concerned that the fund was kind of unable or, or, or uh, yeah, unable to, to to measure or monitor compliance with the strategy. Um, I think another example uh, that the FCA has provided as well, related to statements made by firms relating to sustainability, um, which didn't reconcile with um, investments by these firms in uh, certain high carbon emitting energy companies. So I think in short, all of these claims were intended to to talk up the the entities. Um, green credentials um, in ways that could be misleading. And I think this has become a real issue for companies, um, including those that operate in the banking and finance space who wish to hold themselves out as green or sustainable and, and, and so on. So I think uh, to me, um, part of the problem here is that um, it's may be hard to, to verify um, any green related claim, claims that are made uh, or reporting requirements. Um, you know, these could require the input of third parties to corroborate certain key aspects of data and so on. So I think also matters are made even more difficult by virtue of the fact that um, there are inconsistencies in the approach um, to measuring environmental matters and, and also different interpretations of terms uh, relating to, to, to the same. So I think what I would also add to this point is that um, you know, as more sophisticated methods of analysis are being developed in order to assist in measuring ESG related disclosures, um, that, that will obviously assist uh, companies should they wish, uh, you know, to, to make ESG claims in the future and also assist in their, their reporting. Um, I think, nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that there are material risks that can, can flow from making an inaccurate or misleading disclosure relating to ESG-related matters. And I think these would include, obviously, uh, reputational damage, but also certain legal or uh, regulatory risks, which, I, which I'll come on to talk about in a moment. Um, so what are the government and the, the regulator uh, doing uh, in order pr to protect against these risks? Uh, these risks rather. Um, so I think it's uh, fair to say that in the last few years, uh, the the UK government and the FCA have, have sought to introduce a number of measures and proposed measures relating to climate change and other sustainability related matters um, in circumstances where there is a real developing, you know, a real strong consensus that ESG concerns are some of the biggest issues uh, that are facing us um, in the 21st century. So what I'm going to do now is just provide some details of some of the key measures that have been put forward. Um, so during the course of uh, 2021, um, the UK government introduced a mandatory uh, climate reporting uh, regime in respect of a series of listed companies. And I think as part of these rules and uh, in accordance with recommendations from the UK's task force on climate related financial disclosures, uh, listed companies are required to include a statement um, in their annual report relating to various matters. And these include the company's governments around climate related risks and opportunities uh, arising therefrom. Um, actual and potential impacts of climate related risks and opportunities on the company's businesses, strategy and, and planning where such information is material. Um, details as to how the company identifies climate related risks and also uh, details relating to the metrics and targets used to assess and manage um, relevant climate related risks and opportunities. I think, again, where such information is material. Um, where the relevant company has not included uh, such details in its annual report, then it also has to provide an explanation as to as to why it hasn't done so. Um, I think moving on, I think at the end of December 2021, the FCA has introduced a kind of similar climate-related 
uh, financial uh, set of disclosure rules for asset managers, for life insurers, regulated pension providers and issuers of standard listed equity shares. And also the government has uh, confirmed that it's looking to introduce a sustainability disclosure requirement and UK green taxonomy uh, during the course of 2022, which would uh, seek to cover the UK economy as a whole. Um, I think in addition as well, the FCA has um, published guidance relating to the labelling of financial products as sustainable or green. And I think this is understood to tie in with the government's sustainability disclosure requirement plans. And I think additionally as well, um, during COP26, uh, Rishi Sunak announced that the government also plans to introduce a roadmap for the UK's uh, financial sector's commitment to net zero financed emissions uh, by 2050, uh, so, you know, to bring it into line with the Paris Agreement. So, I think just on that point as well, a number of operators in the, the banking and finance sector have already committed to the to the terms of the, the Paris Agreement, which is obviously important. So, I think it's generally clear from all of the measures uh, that have been taken by the regulator and, 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 and the UK government, there's obviously there's a real appetite um, from uh, from both to take steps to address kind of the environmental issues uh, that are facing all of us. So I think it's also clear that um, financial institutions and others operating in the sector are seeking to operate in a more environmentally conscious way and whether that be in the context of the business decisions they make or um, in, re in relation to the relevant disclosures that they're required to provide. So I think the final question uh, just to consider along these lines is, is the extent to which these matters um, could result um, in litigation conducted in England. Um, so just on a more kind of uh, macro uh, scale, I should start by kind of answering this question you know, by noting that there is some momentum uh, surrounding environmental related disputes in, in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, so by way of example, um, I've seen uh, claims brought in Europe um, against certain high carbon emitting businesses and, and against countries for failing to take adequate steps to follow the Paris Agreement. Um, I think such claims as well um, have included uh, an action actually brought by Friends of the Earth in Holland against Shell, which would, which actually resulted in the court requiring the energy company to reduce its CO2 emissions by 45% within 10 years. Um, kind of on a sort of in a banking context, um, I've also uh, seen from some of the kind of investigation that I've done on, on this topic uh, that there was some action taken by shareholders of, uh, over the last few years um, um, who held um, an interest in the uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia uh, to obtain certain disclosure um, of documents relating to the bank's involvement in projects that uh, the shareholders have alleged have infringed the comp or the banks, I should say, um, environmental and social policies that were published in 2019. And I think the same shareholders, uh, it should uh, be noted, have also ta uh, taken action against the bank in 2017. This time, um, or, or that time, it related to the bank's alleged failures to adequately disclose climate-related risks in its 2016 annual report. Um, so, that case uh, actually settled uh, shortly after being brought, but there will be a number of other cases, I'm sure. Um, but kind of bringing it back into kind of this jurisdiction, I think at the moment, I think it's not clear uh, whether operators in the banking and finance sector or for that matter, kind of companies more broadly are going to be the targets of, of legal claims related to ESG related matters. Um, I think it seems to me that that you know the mood music um I, I i would say is that there's a real prospect of this happening but in terms of the timeline i, I think it's unclear as to as to when that those cases might come um i think part of the issue actually arises from you know to me is you know arises from the the difficulties in actually measuring and and proving some of these green and sustainability related claims and i think that might be a bit of a stumbling block that potentially could be removed as uh, methods of analysis analysis uh, become more sophisticated so um if such kind of greenwashing or or sustainability type claims are to be brought in england then 
I think they could be brought in a, in a number of ways. And I think we've kind of touched upon broadly earlier in the session, we, we could see claims relating to misrepresentation or, or mis-selling of, of investment products that are said to be green or sustainable. Um, I think it's uh, fair to say that we've seen a, a, a huge rise in of, you know, shareholder activism in, in England in the last few years that have stemmed from the drop in share price as a result of possible misleading claims. Um, and I think we could see claims being brought in a, in a greenwashing context. Um, and those claims could be, as we've seen in other cases, be brought as kind of a rep, reg, uh, representative action uh, pursuant to CPR 19.6, because obviously the underlying issues uh, are likely to be common to each of the potential claimants. Um, in terms of other avenues or other kind of sort of heads of claims, I think we could potentially, you know, in this area, see claims that are made under sections 90 and 98 of uh, FISMA uh, relating to sh kind of shares or securities that are bought by investors um, in purported reliance on misleading information. And I think finally as well, I think there could be a raft of, of, of regulatory issues um, for entities um, who have fallen foul of ESG related rules uh, that have been published or uh, or at least have been proposed uh, you know to be introduced by the FCA and again I just I think I just finished by reiterating that I think it's a little early in the piece just to know when these claims are likely to come but I'm confident that the, the causes of action and, and claims will develop as, as mechanisms uh, to verify the relevant data also uh, develop. Um, so um, that's that's it from me um, on, on that. I think we could speak uh, for, for much longer, but I'm just conscious of the, of the, of the time uh, that we've got available. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ian. That's really interesting. I'm very in keeping with the LIDW's uh, uh, theme this year of global, sustainable and ethical question mark. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions um, for, for Ian and the, and the rest of the panel. Um, well, well I, 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 I've got, I've got uh, what, what one question which um, uh, arose out of the point you made about the litigation in Holland that mm -hmm. uh, was against, I think, Shell, was it? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that you, according to your description, was uh, relatively successful by the claimants. And w whether that reveals any insight into the difference in approach, perceived difference in approach, by the Dutch courts versus the English courts, because presumably uh, Shell being dual listed in Amsterdam and mm -hmm. London. I imagine that the claimants could have brought the same claim in London, but uh, obviously chose to do so in Holland, and that was successful. I mean, does that give you give one any sort of insight as to whether other jurisdictions, whether it's Europe or the US or anywhere else, might be more favourable for this type of climate um, or environmental uh, uh, activist litigation ra rather than London? Um, well, I think, um, I suppose it remains to be seen, uh, Jasper. I think, you know, what I've, you know, from the, from the kind of uh, sort of investigation that I've undertaken, it seems to me like um, kind of other jurisdictions, kind of whether that be Europe or kind of sort of across the world um, are maybe more uh, amenable to, to, to hear. Uh, these sorts of issues. Um, I guess, I mean, what, what I would say in, 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 in the English context is that obviously it's really, you know, looking at the causes of action uh, that are available uh, to, to the uh, potential claimants. And I think obviously a, a decision was made um, you know that that um, that you know the, the legal tools uh, that are on offer um, before the English courts um, weren't um, I don't want to say fit for purpose but fit for the you know the 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 goal that they wanted to achieve um, in the in the in the case um, against Shell. Um, but it really remains to be seen. I really think that just in certainly in this jurisdiction, I mean, I guess it's a question of sort of causation and proving your your case. And I think 
the issue that that uh, you know I, I have some sympathy for for companies who are required to to you know you know to to comply with these reporting um, regimes in circumstances where you know there are certain you know certain areas are open to interpretation uh, there isn't a, a fixed kind of set of rules that all of companies um, or all individuals are required to subscribe to and I think once that develops I think we might see uh, get more cases come because there's just a real kind of hard metric that that that, that claimants will be able to measure um, compliance or performance against. This was a topic actually at a recent IBA conference where um, I, I, there, there was a panel particularly talking about the jurisdictional differences and I think the conclusion of that panel was that um, civil law jurisdictions are generally more amenable uh, to yep. these cases than common law. And the US interesting in particular is particularly challenging. Um, and, and the point was made at that conference anyway, that if, if the US aren't able to get these cases over the line, you know, it might be more difficult in this jurisdiction. Anyway, I think we probably need to let everybody uh, get on with their days. So thank you so much um, for, 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 for joining. Uh, I hope everybody found it interesting. And um, fortunately, we don't get to talk about it in the in the break after this panel because we're all virtual. But no doubt, we'll uh, we'll run into each other uh, soon enough. Thanks a lot.